I'm pleased to be here with Rabbi Amy Alberg, who is the author of From Enemy to Friend, Jewish Wisdom and the Pursuit of Peace. She's involved in many different activist cause, interfaith work, um, and has had just a, a fascinating dynamic career as a, as a rabbi, and most importantly, as a, as a friend and mentor and chavruta in, in our Musar studies. So thanks for taking some time to talk. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here with you. So to start, as the, um, to talk a little bit about spiritual callings. Um, looking at your journey, you were um, the first woman, of course, to be ordained in the conservative movement. And I wonder, what was that journey like for you? What sort of, what was your experience of discovery and of your decision to enter rabbinical school at that time? Well, so first to say, I'm very much aware that calling is not a concept that Jews are necessarily uh, familiar with or comfortable with. Right. Uh, I've learned that and not all Christians are either. Uh -huh. Actually, Christians aren't all alike either. Uh, right. but, um, and I wouldn't have used this language along the way, uh -huh. but only kind of in retrospect. Um, I really have come very strongly, I mean, as my own spiritual, as my own personal spiritual life has unfolded, um, I've come to be in relationship with the divine in an entirely different way than I was when I was first making my yeah. career decision, so to speak. So um, looking back now from, you know, 30 plus years, mm -hmm. um, there's a sense of... I've, I've, there's a Christian Roman Catholic um, scholar of calling, of vocation, um, who's one of her who said, who writes about the subject, and one of her definitions of what a calling is is it's something that you can't not do. Mm. So you feel um, moved, almost compelled. Almost a sense of no choice. As mm -hmm. I as I look back, I don't know. Of course, we have choices. Right. As I look back at it. Um, I was I mean, powerfully moved by, by my Judaism. It was clear that I had some leadership potential. I was fascinated with people. Mm -hmm. That it was something, you know, it was it was the right place for me mm -hmm. to exercise my passion. And I was also a person with I, I wouldn't have called it social justice passion at the time. I, the language would have been different. Um, but there was a burning in me to respond to the injustice that my movement, there was, you know, by the time I got out of college, before my new construction students were right. already ordaining women, um, there was a burning passion in me to be part of the struggle. I didn't know at the beginning that, you know, that I would be first or fifth or tenth or whatever, but I wanted it to happen. And I didn't even actually know what sort of rabbi I wanted to be. I just knew that I wanted the doors to be open. Yeah, yeah. And it seemed like I was the sort of person who, that this was what I was supposed to do. And the, and the amazing thing about it, and this is, there's mystery in this, is that I had no idea when I was 25, when mm -hmm. I first, 20, 19, when I first decided I want to be a rabbi, nor when I was 30, when I was ordained, how right it would be for me and, and how my rabbinate would unfold over, right. over the years. But I had no idea at that, at yeah. that time that it really, really was the right thing. So, the, I mean, just... If you share a little bit about the process, I mean, what was it like to apply at the time when they weren't even accepting women? What was that process like? You couldn't apply. Okay, so how did, you, no, how did you get through the doors? A number of women, Susanna Heschel, yeah. submitted an application. Uh -huh. They wrote back and said, uh -huh. you know very well, we don't accept Even with their father being there, yeah. Yeah, you accept applications for women. <laughs> you know, long, long story. I went, in short, I graduated from Brandeis yeah. with a Judaic Studies degree, went to the seminary, uh -huh. uh, into the grad school. Grad school, women could take any class and could mm -hmm. get any degree that the seminary offered other than a rabbinic degree. Mm -hmm. So I went uh, into the master's and then in, in the doctorate, in doctoral program in Talmud, I didn't finish the PhD program. But, um, so uh, both because I'd fallen in love with Talmud by that point in my life and there was a political sense, and this was self conscious, that um, the word on the street was if there was anything that would that might have an impact on the decision-making process of the faculty and the Talmud faculty were at the center of the decision. It was they who had to make the decision to mm -hmm. open the doors mm -hmm. or not. It was seeing young women who were passionate about their Talmud study especially. Mm -hmm. So it was both because it was my Jewish love and because it was a political act to, mm -hmm. uh, to study Talmud. So I went and was in the grad school for many years and I went to Israel and. They went in and out over many years. They went. They went. The, they brought the subject up for a decision, and then they tabled the tabled the vote because they 
where you get the sky would fall in, uh -huh. and back and forth over many years. Yeah. Um, and then I gave up and thought, I actually said to myself, this is at age 26 or 7, I said to myself, look, they may not get their act together or ordained women in time for me, maybe it'll be in time for my daughter. I didn't have a daughter yet. I now thank God I have a daughter. I said that to myself. I thought, so I need to figure out how to craft my career without the title rabbi. So I had all these years then of Talmud study and at, the, at JTS and then went to social work school, clinical social work school. I actually said to myself, I'll put those two things together. I'll figure out they won't make me a rabbi with capital R. Right. I'll figure out some way to be a rabbi with a small r, uh -huh. bring all those things together, find right. some context. And while I was in social work school, Long story, Professor Lieberman died, and he was the center of the resistance uh, okay. to opening mm -hmm. the doors. And after he died, the dynamic mm -hmm. shifted. And in the meantime, there was there was a, both a top-down and a bottom-up uh -huh. process. The conservative movement, the rabbis, the lay people were really pushing. Yeah. Um, so um, they, the vote to ordain women came while I was in the middle of my, my mm -hmm. MSW training, and it took me about... Ten seconds to decide that I would finish the interview right. and then, right. and then, and then go down. Awesome. You know, that so then, how did listening and finding your calling continue to play out as you moved into your early stages of your career in, in both uh, chaplaincy and spiritual direction work? So I realized at a certain point, once I was in rabbinical school, yeah. that I really wasn't entirely. I didn't have a perfectly clear mm -hmm. picture of what sort of rabbi I, I, I wanted to be. There are some people who decided when they're there's women who decided when they were. 12 or 13, mm -hmm. I want to be the rabbi of a congregation. I didn't have that clear a mm -hmm. picture of it. Um, so my, I began looking around. By then I had done social work training, which in the clinical training had impacted me profoundly. So my then husband was recruited for a job at Indiana University. I burst into tears. I thought I was about to be ordained. I thought, you know, I'm getting ordained after all this struggle and whatever. Well, what, how am I going to find a rabbinic job? Mm -hmm. The week that he was offered his job at Indiana University, a position was created for uh, for the first time for a Jewish chaplain to, to join the uh, chaplaincy staff, which had 10 uh -huh. Christians on it. I was the 11th mm -hmm. first Jew on the large wow. chaplaincy staff of Methodist Hospital. And I hesitated at first because I'm the kind of kid who's afraid of blood and, you know, all of that. I wasn't sort of a natural mm -hmm. ambulance chaser sort of chaplain, but it was clear that I wanted a clinical rabbinate. I wanted a rabbinate that was really about relationship and bringing mm -hmm. my Jewish passion into um, mm -hmm. intimate spaces with people. Yeah. Again, it was obvious that's not the job I would have chosen, mm -hmm. but that's the job that was there, yeah. and then it was clear that I was supposed to do it. And then at a certain point, um, after doing some acute care chaplaincy and working with the Jewish Healing Center, yeah. which was a tremendous blessing, where I did hospice work in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic and other things, very, very holy work, which I loved. At a certain point, I realized that I was, I was starting to suffer from burnout. Mm -hmm. As much as I loved the work, it was hard to recognize that, mm -hmm. but to really listen. Yeah. Really listening meant acknowledging that, and something else started sort of whispering to me, mm -hmm. and that there was, there, was, there was this practice called spiritual direction, which is a particular form of spiritual counseling that had its origins in the Roman Catholic Church, actually, but that in those years was beginning to make its way into Jewish community, was being translated into yeah. Jewish, uh, into Jewish theology, Jewish liturgy, Jewish community context. Um, and that was doing really similar work to chaplaincy, except not in the context of illness. Uh -huh. It was talking, it was listening to people, mm -hmm. um, listening pe listening to people into their own growth and mm -hmm. relationship with the divine, uh, however they understood it. So I did that work, listened to a lot of people. I still sit in, sit in spiritual direction with mm -hmm. people, which is a tremendous exactly. privilege, and I help, help create and, and direct a training program for Jewish spiritual directors. Very, very holy work. And then what called you what called you to this next transition towards fully immersing yourself in peace work? So by then I had a self conscious understanding of how calling works in mm -hmm. my life. And I was fine. I was having a, I was loving my spiritual mm -hmm. direction work. And I had a very powerful experience of calling. Um, and um, I, you know, at first I was almost hesitant to say this to people, people would think I was nuts, whatever. 
Um, I happen to be, happen to be, if you believe in happenstance, uh, in Israel, visiting our stepson, visiting a dialogue center where I sat and watched her one-way mirror as a group of Israeli teens and Palestinian teens um, learned each other's names, literally, at the very beginning of a three-day dialogue program. Wow. And I watched them, and it was the experience of just watching them at the just at the very beginning of yeah. relationship with one another was so riveting to me that I, I really felt like I was attached to the floor when it was time to leave. I didn't want to get up from my chair. Told the story afterwards. Told the story to my husband and my stepson. Said it. Every time I told the story, I realized that I made this motion, and I thought, you know what happened? Ki'ilu. You know, this is a big, you know, kiviacho. I don't believe that. God speaks with a voice, and you know, but in a in a metaphoric sense, my experience was that God called out to me and said, "Roll up your sleeves mm -hmm. for the cause of peace." Mm -hmm. So I said, "Yes," but then I went back to I had recently moved to Minnesota. Here I am in St. Paul, Minnesota, right. like yeah. waiting for further instructions. Okay, mm -hmm. I said yes. Now, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. I'm mean, actually, mm -hmm. you know, waiting for some skywriting or something. So I, you know, I studied, I networked, yeah. I met, you know, all sorts of people, put myself through training programs, um, to try to figure out how could I, um, how could I serve the cause of peace, mm -hmm. and that took me in a number of directions: interfaith dialogue, yeah. intra-Jewish dialogue, a lot of engagement with mm -hmm. Israeli and Palestinian um, uh, grassroots relationship builders, um, but all of it driven by kind of an engine, like there, there still was a, a fire in me that I, I, I'm supposed to serve the cause of peace. And that, and I actually wanted to do it in, in, in my whole life. It wasn't only about the work that I was paid for, um, but I also needed for my primary professional engagement to be in faithful serv service to that call. Um, and I've been doing it ever since, and not obviously I haven't made peace. Um, um, but um, I think I have been faithful to that call. That's very inspiring. So my last question for you would be, um, a lot of folks haven't been blessed with the experience, experiences you've had of, of, of an inner clarity, an inner burning, that sense of urgent calling. Um, how would you suggest folks even get in touch with that? I think. It very much resonates for me. Uh, even the language calling resonates for me. In fact, I was in a documentary called The Calling. Oh. Um, but <clears throat> for a lot of folks, they have, they're, they're maybe values driven, they're reflective, um, they think pragmatically, but they haven't had that kind of spiritual awakening, if you will. So how would you advise that they kind of you know, embark upon this kind of discovery process? So the first thing is not to get hung up on what exactly is their relationship with God or image of uh -huh. God yeah. or non-image of God. Yeah. Um, you can have calling, um, you can try to attend, you can try to craft your life around mm -hmm. calling without there being a caller with a capital C. Mm -hmm. That is, you don't, have to, you don't have to have a particular mm -hmm. personal, certainly mm -hmm. anthropomorphic image mm -hmm. of God mm -hmm. um, in order to enter, even to use this language, right. to enter into this kind right. of exploration. Yeah, so that's yeah. the one thing. Don't yeah. let that get in the way. Don't, don't let the yeah. language get in the way. Um, and yes, Jews do do this. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's most of all about listening. It's about listening internally and about listening um, around us. Uh, one of my favorite definitions of uh, calling is call, the work that is your calling is where the heart's joy meets the world's need. Mm -hmm. So it's about listening to looking around me, what most pains mm -hmm. me, I mean, the world has many, many needs. One of the ones that I, I, I am so, that I can't not listen to, because they're so, they speak so directly to me. And then listening inwardly, when, you know, when I think about addressing this issue or that issue, do I get exhausted or disgusted or yeah. Yeah. alienated? Or to, to which area do I, do I respond with? energy and delight and excitement. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it really sort of makes me happy, even though know, it's hard work. I'm not talking about things that are necessarily easy yeah. to do, yeah. but where there is that sense of um, 
enlivening mm -hmm. and excitement mm -hmm. and yes I'd like to be part of mm -hmm. this and I think I have something to contribute yeah. and no matter what the end point of my labors is um, I want to be part of that right. um, and also listening to what people around you say I mean I'm a rabbi because my college rabbi um, heard me leave davening one day my freshman year of college took me out to lunch and said you got to be a rabbi. Right. And I said, don't be ridiculous. Yeah, right, like whatever. Right. Um, so listening to the people around, I mean, I know lots of people who say, you know, I've been a, I've been a mediator since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I've always been the one who's listened to people, or, uh -huh. uh, you know, whatever it is. Or I've always been the engineer in the family. Right. Um, so to listen to how people reflect your particular yeah, gifts. So, so it's this listening on a number of Love that. Number of different and where the players. I love where the heart's joy meets the world's need. I think um, I'm convinced that when you lead from darkness, you produce darkness, and if you lead from light, you produce light. And and the sense of it's not just leading from your anger, but leading from your heart's joy, and you're still working to resolve messy stuff, oftentimes. Um, but um, it's very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. I encourage folks to uh, pick up this book from Enemy to Friend by Rabbi Amy Abrik. Thank you. You should be blessed with lots of years of health and strength to do your wonderful holy work. Thank you. It's been a great session.